Greetings, everybody. Um, I'm not sure if it's a good thing to see so many old faces <laughs> still here. <laughs> It'd be nice if uh, all the people who'd been to other meetings of well me who were sick were now better, <laughs> and therefore not here. But congratulations for keeping going and for still looking after each other in the way that you do. And um, greetings to all the people who are not physically present in this room, who we know are affected by this terrible disease. And um, greetings to a better future that we all look forward to. So I've called my talk The Blind Spot. Dr. Rosie Daniels said, carers are in the blind spot. And I want to talk about the crisis of care and its personal dimensions, especially the care of those most affected by this illness. We need to talk about it because this illness takes a toll on everybody. We need to acknowledge the way that it cuts off and isolates us. And I think the issue of care, its provision, its impacts need to be part of that discussion. But it's very difficult to talk about this blind spot because the suffering of the carer is not comparable to the suffering of the patient and should not invalidate it. In, sometimes it can seem to, by focusing on the issues for the carer, seem to invalidate what's the, the, the cared for's suffering. The experience, many uh, carers experience survivor guilt while at the same time experiencing acute grief and loss on behalf of their patient. Survivor guilt can also obscure the anguish of the carer, even from themselves. So the problem is how to maintain the dignity of the patient faced with extreme dependency and issues of profound loss. The carer must be focused on respecting and promoting the manner of their patients. And in talking about their own experience, they raise issues of consent and the privacy issue of their patients who may not identify with the label and who may wish to avoid the invalidation and being stuck with a sick identity. They may want to move on and it may be very difficult. They don't want to be known forever to be tarred with the ME brush. So the patient almost may also not necessarily accept the same approach to the disease, to the illness, and will have definitely different points of view. And the patient may also have some quite significant guilt about the imposition of their care needs on their carer. So carers tend to swallow their concerns because speaking out publicly may impose an identity on the cared for as well as the carer which they do not choose. So I'm going to talk generically. I've cared for three severely ill ME people in different circumstances and places and it's had a major impact on my life. And talking about it is quite difficult because you go back to the most difficult experiences and their consequences and the consequences they have in an atmosphere which invalidates these as real or as at least justified. So it's quite painful to um, uh, remind myself of the terror, the fear, the anxiety, the anguish of trying to care for the severely affected person. And I think that never leaves you, that anxiety, even if the peer person experiences a good recovery. By the way, I think it's Emmy's more common, and I actually think recovery is more common than is often recognized. Anyway, um, those who do recover often want to get away from the illness as far and fast as they can. Um, and that makes providing support quite difficult because, of course, they want to deny that this happened to them. They want to move on. And that's also um, a, a real problem for our organisations and our support. 
In addition, the relapsing and remitting nature of the illness and the fear of relapse can create in everybody associated with it a state of hypervigilance. The unknown triggers perpetuate anxiety and any hint of relapse may reignite traumatic memory in both patient and carer. And I think the stress response is very relevant actually to this illness. I believe that most people um, associated with it have a degree of post-traumatic stress disorder. And why wouldn't we, for heaven's sake? Mm -hmm. You know. Um, so one of the major tasks of the carer is how to promote a healing environment, but it may be very difficult in the face of this anxiety response. But let me say that caring for the profoundly ill can also be an awe-inspiring experience, promoting profound respect for Wairau. Wairau. Our Wairau. <laughs> To experience directly the essential spirit of the person is a profound gift. And experiencing the power of Araha within yourself is to share in the reality of Araha Nui. So let's look at the demands of the caring role. Sometimes it's said that caring for a profoundly, um, a person profoundly disabled by illness is like caring for a baby. Caring for the seriously ill involves dependency, it's true. The carer must negotiate and mediate the outside world, must provide a quiet space, reduce sensory stimulus, warmth, comfort, food. But the physical demands of feeding, cleaning, moving, changing may be similar, but the emotional reality is profoundly different. A baby is a source of hope, growth, development and anticipated future not grief, loss and fear. Dependency is a key issue in the caring relationship. How is the carer to promote a sense of agency and dignity for someone unable to undertake the most basic processes of self-care? The dependency is not just physical, however, it's emotional too. Caring for a baby demands a capacity in the carer to merge, to identify, to mirror the child. But caring for the adult requires the maintenance of boundaries, of recognition of difference, if it is not to infantilize both parties. The autonomy and respect due to the adult person are countermanded every day by physical dependence. How do you negotiate that? Yeah, um, there is a sense in which care and cared for can never get the emotional distance of their relationship right. It's either too close or it's not enough. They struggle to maintain a viable but porous boundaries which can become hopelessly blurred through this unchosen closeness. Emmy disrupts the normal path of growth and maturation. Children usually recover, but they lo may lose key experiences along the way. There is a developmental as well as schooling losses. Physical, intellectual and emotional growth can be disrupted. Young adults do not get the experience of gradual growth of independence, a movement towards autonomy, of trying and testing choices. They miss out on basic experiences of social life and personal development. The loss of a sense of a future may grind at the young adult who longs for experiences of their own to share the small and large opportunity as of their peers. They may then express their frustration and rage at their loss on the only available person who is likely to be their carer. Meanwhile, the carer is likely to have lost many adult rewards of expanded opportunities and may be dealing with a double workload and or loss of income themselves or the strain in other relationship with partners, other children, and their wider social commitments. The care for may well develop furious anger at those they depend upon, resentful of the denial of their autonomy in their everyday life. The illness may also create dependent personality disorder in those whose development has been thwarted. The carers may well uh, uh, 
reciprocate because of their own attachment needs and they may also develop significant dependencies on their caring role and on the person themselves so that you will develop a codependence which may persist long after the illness itself loses its bite. So how can we prevent the role of carer taking over the life? Find and maintain alternative meanings. How can both cared for and carer not become the disease, taken over, obsessed, and in a state of perpetual hyperarousal? One way might be to recognize the reality of the uh, PTSD and seek treatment for it. But it's not only hard, but, uh, but uh, traumatic stress disorder is hard to treat. And those who might offer us assistance all too often deny the reality of the illness. The counselors, therapists, and doctors may share a common belief in the non validity of the cause of the distress. So if you're seeking such support, I would urge everybody to be very careful and very selective about how they seek it from, who they seek it from. You know, if it doesn't feel right to you, if this doesn't feel like respect for where you're coming from, don't do it. And of course, um, there's very little of the kind of uh, uh, treatment or support we may ideally like in the public sector. So let me turn to what does good practical support for the patient and the carer look like? I did have an experience actually of receiving very good support in one of the uh, countries where I, I was uh, a long time carer. It contrasts very strongly with um, uh, New Zealand, but let me tell you uh, how, how I felt supported. Um, I'm gonna say we. We were provided with an electric bed, one that the position and height could be moved very easily with a t minor touch of a button, which was a great boon to both the carer and the cared for. Being able to change position, see, a different, see out of the window, this kind of thing, sit up, raise their legs, it, it was all done very simply with no physical force. It also helped enormously for the carer to manage the patient because you could slide the person on the, on the mattress and you could also uh, manage toileting and things like that. If somebody's not capable of feeding themselves or defecating on their own, you really need, uh, and they're heavy, um, you know, I'm actually quite small <laughs> and I, I found the, um, uh, the uh, electric bed uh, essential really. And that takes me to one of the um, things that I found most difficult and that was experiences of actually getting physically stuck with my patient just being unable to move them and um, I remember vividly um, an occasion on which uh, one of my patients had crawl, tried to crawl to the toilet and got stuck in the hallway couldn't get any further and I could not move them I managed to roll them onto a plastic sheet um, and make them comfortable and, and keep them warm, but I actually couldn't do anything about it. Eventually, I was um, offered a place with five others who were, uh, five other carers who were considered to be caring for some of the most difficult situations in that um, area to a manual handling course. And it, it sounds kind of limited, but actually I found it enormously supportive enormously supportive because it validated the existence of a problem and it provided me with solutions and it I felt less alone better equipped and more legitimate in calling for the help I might need for example to call the ambulance to get to the to hospital appointments we used to um, uh, use a banana boat you know one of those ones that um, slides along the ground and um, it, it, uh, it was very effective and, and the ambulance officers were extremely gentle and, and kindly and supportive actually. And this followed a situation where my patient had gone to hospital. I had been taken off to be interviewed by a psychiatrist to see what my nuttiness was, that I believed in this illness. 
and she, uh, the psychiatrist was trying to get me to agree to the inpatient care of my patient and I was extremely cautious as this went on. And when I came out, um, I found the patient had uh, used a commode, couldn't stay on it and had been left lying on the floor incapacitated because it, was it wasn't part of nurses' job to lift patients and nobody was going to legitimise that this person couldn't move. And the indignity of being lying there on the hospital floor unhelped was deeply traumatic. And then I was faced with the problem of how to get them home. And so I found, for example, the inclusion of manual handling extremely helpful. They also helped with things like what to do if the person is attempting to stand and can't support themselves, they'll fall on you. Um, you know, how, how, you, how you do that and how you move it. So it was very uh, validating for me and um, it helped with transport. Eventually, um, we bought a reclining wheelchair. That was not provided on the public purse. The rest of this was all provided on the public purse. And life improved um, very greatly. Because, of course, if you have an M ME person um, using a wheelchair and they become tired, you need the recline facility. And um, I, I think that, that gave, my, gave us a great deal of confidence. But what was most significant was um, the provision of three hours, seven days a week, uh, personal care coming through the door. Somebody who cared, who minded, who could deal with it, came through that door regularly on the dot. And their, uh, the physical labour uh, was, uh, was very, very supportive, but also the flexibility. If the patient was too ill to receive personal care, they did household work. And there is a lot of physical work involved in um, caring. I also got two full days of respite care a week so that I could go out to shop, visit, study, even entertainment. Um, and uh, I could visit friends, seek social company, distraction or whatever. What I actually did with that time was sign up to a university to take a, a master's in complementary therapy studies because we'd had so much help from the alternative sector. What I actually found there was extraordinary level of judgment about um, a ME. Um, and uh, a belief that it can be addressed by a fairly simple series of remedies. Um, I did go on to um, qualify in quite a number of the therapies I found useful. Um, I haven't practiced in most of them, but um, I found the actual attitudes that I found in that sector of the complementary uh, field very discouraging. And I'd say, again, be very careful. Be very careful about people who, who insist that they can supply you with relatively simple solutions. The answer, I think, is that many of them can really help. There are things which will make a difference. But um, there's, uh, at the time, complementary therapy was trying to get in on the um, uh, demand for more holistic care within the uh, physical health services by um, uh, adopting the model of um, uh, medically unexplained symptoms. Uh, but... Uh, so what I found wasn't uh, my support there so much as the main thing has been to experience the commonality with those who accept the illness as real and are committed to changing it. That is, that's where I found the most support. I've been extremely fortunate to go to many of the annual Invest in ME conferences in London. And you get very good um, uh, accounts from Ros Vallings of the technical side of that. But for me, the key thing is the sense that you don't have to explain anything. You're among people who are committed and committed to change. 
The conference brings together world-class researchers with a commitment uh, and, one, and clinicians, researchers and patients. It's a critical, critical trio. You, you don't want any of them to be isolated. And I think it's inspirational to make sure that your, your researchers are, are connected to the, to the patients. Uh, many of my, clinical, uh, my medical heroes uh, turn up there and I can touch their hem. Uh, clinicians like Dan Peterson, um, who for 30 years has stuck by his patients in um, uh, Lake Tahoe. He's collected data, meticulously recorded cases, collected the key data and tirelessly moved along with the research agenda. Much of the data only exists because that clinician stuck with what his patients were saying. Um, without him, the samples and the case histories wouldn't be there, and others wouldn't have been guided and added uh, and able to add to the general store of knowledge. Another hero of mine this year was researcher Nancy, Nancy Klimas, who first provided evidence of the key immune system abnormalities, and crucially, who has continued to scrape the money together from her other budgets to keep the issue alive. She's never had money just for that, just for ME research. I spent dinner time talking to the leading Stanford professor, Ron Davis, whose extraordinary engineering ingenuity is creating the technology which allow the collection of the sort of mass data that will be necessary to sort out this complex picture, in, and he hopes in time to save his most seriously sick son. It's so heartening that all these people have stuck with it for so long, and have bringing their experiences and prestige to the field despite so little institutional support for their endeavors. That's why I think they're heroes. They've had to go against the grain. But really, what makes it worthwhile being at the London Conference is not having to explain, not having to fend off the skepticism, even from those of goodwill, those who, and those who can't even begin to imagine this illness. It's only in the atmosphere of validation that I become really aware of the, skeptic of the skepticism, of the toll it takes on every one of us associated with this illness. The difficulty of explaining or describing it, the lack of understanding even from the well-meaning, from family members, from friends. And I think that, you know, all of us are bound up in that. It, the sick and their carers are all affected by the lack of credibility and too often it applies to the clinicians and researchers who have tried to help them too. All of the people I've mentioned have been subject to a degree of, of, of um, uh, scepticism. But the battle for understanding has, I think, moved forward last, uh, last this year, 2017. The after-dinner speaker was David Tuller, an academic science uh, writer, science journalist, who's published exposures of the bad science of the PACE trial in the New York Times and elsewhere has been of very great significance. Tuller's first article for the New York Times did not go as far as did some newspaper headlines saying that ME could be cured with short treatments of CBT and, and uh, graded exercise. Thank you, Daily Mail. But it did report that up to 60% of findings that are of PACE participants uh, uh, experienced improvement or cure following CBT or graded exercise, up to 60%. But Tuller noticed, even as he was writing the article, that this did not describe the experience of a, of a sick friend. He began to ask questions and soon found that there were a number of patients who had already identified some very serious flaws in the science of the PACE trial uh, and set up um, in, in both the setup and the analysis. Their inquiries, just like at National Women's 30 years ago, uh, were earlier met by furious resistance from the researchers responsible and the university involved. 
It was through pure persistence in access, the patient's pure persistence in accessing the original study data that the trials had been, that it was possible to show that the trials had been manipulated by such completely unacceptable devices as altering the inclusion criteria and the recovery measures during the course of the trial. So that, for example, 13% had been sick and patients had been sick enough to meet the inclusion criteria, but we had, without change in their measurement of their conditions, been found to be improved or cured. So the PACE trial is said to provide objective evidence about the effectiveness of short cheat treatments. But in fact, the key measures depended solely on the subjective accounts of patients themselves. The subjects, and they were in an unblinded trial, had received communications from the researchers influencing their expectations of likely success. It's a basic violation of prior trial procedure. These flaws should clearly have invalidated the study and prevented its publication. But they led instead to furious resistance to criticism from the medical establishment. The establishment that is supposed to be most committed to evidence-based medicine. And of course the PACE trial has led to huge implications for policy and practice in Britain and around the world. It's become a key document because it was so large. Well I'm very familiar with bad science but as I say it was 30 years ago I was part of the exposure of the shockingly bad science of the cervical cancer at National Women's Hospital that claimed that carcinoma in situ of the cervix was not a pre-malignant tumour. Not, not a pre-malignant tumour. Like the PACE trial, it took judicial action to force the disclosure of the evidence that would allow proper scrutiny. Proper scientific scrutiny overthrew the results. But the results of this analysis uh, continues to be furiously resent, resisted by some within the medical and hospital and university environment, even some from the very heart of evidence-based medicine. Ian Chalmers, for example, head of the Cochrane, um, leader of the Cochrane uh, um, collaboration internationally, has been a major source of resistance to accepting the reality of the unfortunate experiment and its outcomes. He has um, had enormous influence uh, in preventing the um, publication or the retraction of the, you know, and so forth, proper discussion and acknowledgement of what was wrong. Our analysis 30 years ago argued that this bad science occurred and continued as a result of the exclusive, closed, hierarchical power structure of the hospital and university, which put these researchers beyond scrutiny and we devised solutions which would facilitate appropriate safeguards against poor science. But 30 years of bitter resistance to these findings had followed. And the same with PACE. It took concerted effort through court action to get the research data released so that it could be scientifically assessed. And as we have said, there's been enormous resistance to accepting the findings of that assessment, let alone getting a retraction or an apology. Because evidence-based medicine is supposed to prevent such capture, be objective, produce certainty, but it's been, of course, consistently distorted, especially trials, by corporate interests. There are many parallels, actually, between the unfortunate experiment and PACE. For example, the Lancet editor has refused to publish questions, let alone refutations, of the PACE trial, just like Chambers with the um, cervical cancer inquiry. But um, there have been suggestions, there's been discussion about why PACE was so, uh, uh, why this bad science was promoted and why it occurred. There's been a suggestion that it was a form of corporate um, interest, for, um, uh, not from the drug company, but from insurance. But actually, while there is evidence of insurance-based interests in its management, um, in, in the UK, um, disability insurance is relatively rare. Um, it, it's, not, it's not widespread. I think it's more 
significant to say that this trial was financed by the state, by the government. And it is part and parcel of the neoliberal state adopting an insurance model for health resource allocation. So what's happened since 1988, which is Cartwright, is that the neoliberal state has remodeled healthcare internationally. It's adopted corporate organization um, of our health institutions. For example, our um, publicly owned you know, um, health institutions like hospitals have to return, uh, they have to pay um, a levy to the state, which is interest on their capital assets. That's to produce a level playing field between our hospitals, our publicly owned hospitals and the private ones. That's how it works. We pay millions of dollars back to the government. Government gives the hospital, the DHBs money, they pay it back and so on. And so it goes on. And so while there's dozens of examples of corporate distortion of uh, evidence-based medicine, I think in the, and, and it is reinforced by the new market model of the neoliberal university, which is controlled by management and closely performance managed. It creates insecurity, the casualization of intellectual labor as academics and researchers become contract workers. I think you can't underestimate the distorting effect of um, intellectual labor becoming academics becoming part of the new insecuriat. Always one eye on the next grant, willing to organize their findings, organize their research agenda, having to organize their research agenda to fit the political goals of the neoliberal state. So, Emmy was left out of corporate interests because it, it wasn't about corporate interests because there wasn't any pharmacological intervention. Um, but it's been heavily influenced by the state's adapt, uh, adaption, adoption of the insurance model for resource allocation. And so um, the um, uh, people with long-term illnesses um, uh, long-term disabling illnesses are subject to extraordinary insurance-like assessments for their eligibility, work tests and so forth, highly punitive. And then of course the problem is that the sub insurance models that subjects them to work tests, any people who can't get to work uh, to be test, uh, to get to work tests are forced off benefits. If they're too unwell but unable to prove it, they lose the meagre benefits and they're identified as recalcitrant and malingering because they can't get there. I'll give you one example from my experience of caring for somebody in New Zealand. This person was homebound, um, partially bedbound but mostly homebound, and they applied for a sickness benefit. This is some time ago. They couldn't get a sickness benefit although they needed 24-hour support because they couldn't get to WINS for an interview. And no amount of intervention actually could change this. They couldn't prove they were sick because they couldn't get to WINS. In the end, the solution was to borrow a pickup truck, carry the person out on a mattress, put the mattress in the pickup truck, drive the person covered up to the WINS office, go in and say, this person has come for their sickness interview. Where are they? Well, they're actually sick. You'll find them outside, parked outside. And the WINS officer went out and said, oh, they're sick. <laughs> um, you know, uh, the same sort of thing about not being able to get to work. I mean, you know, these are, these are real and it's about adopting this in insurance. Are you eligible? Can you meet the criteria? How are you going to be measured? in an illness where there's no defined measures. And so we, we find ourselves, um, and I think the issue is that in a system based on competitive individualism, who is to care for those who cannot provide for a care for themselves? Whose responsibility is it? And I think um, what that's 
what has generated what I call the care crisis. And of course, care has been squeezed out even of our hospitals because what they're interested in counting, what the managers count, are procedures. And care isn't really a procedure. And so it, it becomes invisible. And guess who it's, it's referred back to? Largely uh, women in the community. And so um, it becomes you know, invisible, invisible work, implicitly largely women's work. In, care has been even erased from some um, aspects of procedure, such as people being discharged shortly after surgery uh, with no care. You know, what are they supposed to do? Well, it's not our business, you've had your procedure, you know, and so on and so forth. Um, skept, uh, you know, and th this sort of skepticism really, I think, um, has had an enormous effect. What I want to suggest, however, is that the, um, uh, the PACE trial uh, was largely tailor-made to fit the health system restructuring. It was a trial actually set up to um, make, it was at the time that it was set up, uh, there was a very common understanding, widely distributed around the NHS in discussions, that in fact 50% of the patients in, doctors sur in GP surgeries did not fit established diagnostic criteria. They, were, they had MUS. You, be very careful of this slippery definition. MUS is medically unexplained symptoms. They were 50%. And the idea was that if you could um, somehow devise ways of managing these people more effectively, you, they cost the state £6 billion a year and they represented all the people that the doctors were most irritated by, the ones who refused to get better and took more than 10 minutes, you know. And so actually solving this problem of how to, and it was sold to patients, of course, huge improvement in their care. They were going to get holistic care. So actually the NHS was, was um, sold that there would be huge savings, savings of such a great scale that it would save the viability of the health service if this problem could be solved. And it then becomes obvious why the Department of Work and Pensions would become the, the major funder, along with the Medical Research Council and the Department of Health and Scottish Office and some others, very mostly publicly funded, but with this huge input from so uh, what we call it, uh, you know, uh, what we call it wins, so, social welfare. It was about actually limiting the dependency needs, the claims, you know, invalidating the claims you can make for support through an insurance model long term. These were long term, they have, they have long term conditions, LTCs, and they occupy 50% of doctor's surgery. So that's where the design of the study came <coughs> from. And I think um, uh, uh, unwrapping it in this way may not be particularly helpful, but it does understand why the efforts being made to unravel the physical foundations of our distress are, are crucially bound up with legitimating the patients, the carers, and the whole area. And that's why this has you know, been such a... Um, but I'm pointing out that, in fact, the two processes have gone side by side because PACE has also been very influential in the countries from which these other, from which the researchers who are saying no, this this this, this is not correct. You know, we need to um, look critically at these studies. But more than that, we need to do the foundational science and the corruption of trial protocols of of the whole concept actually of the trial as a source of objective knowledge. It feels like to the medical establishment, it's on the line. I think this is why The Lancet won't publish questions. It won't publish statements questioning. They publish the original study. It's like it's beyond question. And 
that, of course, is another example of the kind of authoritarianism we met 30 years ago, that science is supposed to be questioning, open-minded, always open to reason and evidence. Yes, except when it closes its doors and has to be right. And so I think um, uh, what I want to leave you with is not only that there is more recognition, actually, of the enormity of, of the problem and the, and the needs of people. There is. But it's slow. And um, I hope it's not another 30 years before we actually make more progress. But it is very entrenched. But as I've experienced, you know, there are wonderful people out there from all around the world attend, coming together, collaborating, putting their ideas together, working on trying to... Um, uh, Ron Davis's technology is designed to recover enormous details about um, the physical state of patients, attempt to sort out the subgroups, find out what the basic mechanisms actually are, and not um, uh, deal with a simplistic one-size-fits-all, which leads us to so many um, difficulties. There's similar work going on, very slowly, not getting a lot of funding, but people aren't getting up on the autoimmune issues and, and the things that we need to understand. As, as, let's face it, those conditions become more common, actually, for whatever reason. You know, um, they're actually uh, increasing in their... Uh, complexity, and I don't believe that's just a reporting criteria. So I want to leave you with a sense of commonality and hope, but also I hope that I've opened up some ways that we need to um, discuss and recognise um, the dependency needs of the people who are not physically in this room today, but um, need all the help that they can get and all the care and consideration that they deserve. Thank you.